أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Assalamu alaikum my dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaikum assalam Again it's an, a distinct honor and privilege for me to be sharing my insights on some of the select verses of Surah Al-An'am Inshallah, I believe we left off at ayah number 21, is that correct? I believe so, yes Ayah number 21, Inshallah, we'll try to cover a few verses in today's session. So ayah number 21, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا أَوْ كَذَّبًا بِآيَاتِهِ إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ The translation reads, Who does greater wrong than one who fabricates a lie against God or denies his signs? Surely the wrongdoers will not prosper. Now when you examine this verse, you find that from a stylistic perspective, this verse is what the Arabs call istifham istinkari. It's what, what is called in, in linguistics a rhetorical interrogative. And what that essentially means that even though the ayah is framed as a question, Allah is not asking an actual question. It's, you know, it's, it's a rhetorical question. Whereby Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah, He's placing blame and He's scorning a specific group of people that exhibit a specific type of behavior. Now, what's interesting is that this ayah, or, the, or more specifically the expression, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمْ who does greater wrong is actually found in several places in the Quran. Sometimes in reference to those who fabricate who fabricate fabricate lies against God, like in this verse. Elsewhere, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala applies it to those who bar entrance into mosques, those who prevent people from going to houses of worship. So for example, if you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayah number 114, again we see this expression. Allah says, وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ مَنَعَ مَسَاجِدَ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُذْكَرَ فِيهَا اسْمُ وَسَعَى فِي خَرَابِهَا Allah says, who does greater wrong than the one who bars people from entering the mosques? wherein Allah is remembered and such people they strive to bring it to ruin so this is a second ayah where Allah is calling those who prevent people from entering the mosques as those who are committing the greatest wrongdoing in the ayah here in uh, ayah number 21 of surah al-an'am Allah is calling those who fabricate fabricate lies against God as the ones who create who commit the greatest wrongdoing in another ayah, again in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 140, Allah says, وَمَنْ Again, the same expression. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ كَتَمَ شَهَادَةً عِنْدَهُ مِنَ اللَّهِ Who does greater wrong than the one who conceals a testimony from God? Now, when you read these verses, at the surface, they're seemingly contradictory. Because how can all three groups be avlam? Because the word avlam means the one who is committing the greatest wrongdoing. So how can all three groups be considered avlam? It, because the definition of avlam, the most oppressive, the one who's doing the greatest wrong, should be one group. 
Do you, under, do you understand the point that I'm trying to make? In one ayah, Allah says those who, can do, who, those who do the greatest wrong are those who fabricate, fabricate lies against God. And then in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 114, Allah says, Who does greater wrong than those who bar people from entering mosques? And then in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 140, Allah again asks this rhetorical question, Who does greater wrong than those who conceal a testimony from God? Because when you say who does greater wrong than the one who does such and such action, it should be a singular action. But here we have three sets of verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing three crimes as being the greatest wrongdoing. The Mufassirin of the Quran, they notice this. And therefore, they reconcile these verses and they say, that in essence, fabricating a lie against God, as we see in the ayah in Surah Al-An'am, barring people from entering places of worship, as we see in ayah number 114 of Surah Al-Baqarah, and concealing a testimony from God, as we see in ayah number 140 from Surah Al-Baqarah, the Mufassirin, they say, these are all manifestations of kufr and shirk these three crimes are symptoms of one serious spiritual disease and that is the disease of shirk and kuf so in reality there's no contradiction because allah is referring to symptoms to the different symptoms the different manifestations of one single spiritual disease now it's interesting that the word "avlam" is being used. Allah says, "Waman avlamu min man iftara ala Allahi kadiba." The word "zulm" is used, and we're all familiar with this this word, oppression or wrongdoing. Now, you notice that these verses all refer to someone who knowingly rejects the truth and deprives of and is committing something that's depriving others of discovering the truth if you fabricate a lie against god not only are you harming your own soul but you're spreading falsehood in your society that could potentially deprive others from guidance when you bar people from entering houses of worship you bar them from entering places of worship, mosques. You're harming your own soul, but what are you also doing? You're preventing people from going to a place where they can listen to guidance. And thirdly, when you conceal a testimony from God, when you conceal haq, you're also doing what? You're, you're damaging your own soul and you're depriving others of divine guidance. So therein lies the secret behind why these actions are the greatest wrongdoing. Because you're hurting yourself and also you're hurting others. You're depriving yourself of hidayah and you're depriving others of hidayah. There's a beautiful hadith from Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi alayhi and all of the traditions of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam are eloquent and beautiful. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, Ala wa inna dhulma thalatha. Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, Behold, oppression is of three types. There are three types of dhulm, of wrongdoing and oppression. Fadhulmun la yughfa. There's a type of dhulm, a type of wrongdoing, a type of oppression that is unforgivable. وَظُلْمٌ لَا يُتْرَكُ Secondly, the Imam says, the second type of dhulm is a type of dhulm, a type of oppression that has to be taken into account. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot just overlook it. وَظُلْمٌ مَغْفُورٌ 
and a type of lulm, a type of oppression or wrongdoing that is forgivable. And then the Imam explains each. And this is, by the way, in Nahjul Balagha, Khutbah, Sermon number 176, if you want to make a note and refer back to it. So the Imam then extrapolates, the Imam then expounds on each of these types of oppression. The Imam says, as for the zulm, the oppression, the wrongdoing that is unforgivable, فَالشِّرْكُ billah, Ascribing partners to Allah. This is assuming that a person has died and they meet Allah on the Day of Judgment. It's unforgivable. In the same way, it's not because Allah refuses to forgive them. It's because you have to understand that there are certain spiritual diseases that can be treated in the, in the hospital of Jahannam, if we want to refer to Jahannam as a spiritual hospital. And then there are certain spiritual diseases that are terminal. Just like when you go to the hospital, there are certain patients, they go in and out. They see the doctor and they're only there temporarily, a few hours and they get to leave. There are other patients that are more long-term. They might have to stay for a few days, a few weeks, a few months. But eventually they leave. They have a curable illness. But what happens to those who have terminal illnesses? They remain. They, they remain. They're in hospice. They're, they have terminal illnesses. The one who has a terminal spiritual disease remains in Jahannam forever. Not because Allah just doesn't want to forgive him. It's because that's the nature of that spiritual disease. Shirk is, is a spiritual disease that causes irreversible damage to the soul. This is number one. Number two, يُغْفَارُ فَظُلْمُ الْعَبْدِ نَفْسَهُ عِنْدَ بَعْضِ الْهَنَاتِ As for the type of lulm, the type of oppression that is forgivable, it's the sins that we commit against ourselves, meaning we're not hurting another party. So for example, if I don't pray, I miss Salatul Fajr on purpose, I committed a sin, but I wronged myself, I didn't wrong anyone else. If you're only wronging yourself, if, you're, if the, the sin that you're committing is only damaging yourself, Allah will be a lot more easygoing. But the moment you involve other people, this is when Amir al as he says with the third category, as for the sin, the oppression that will not be just overlooked, Allah will have to take it into account. When people oppress each other, when you hurt another human being, when you deprive another human being of guidance, Allah cannot overlook that unless that person pardons you. So here, when we go back to those three categories of verses where the expression وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ is being used, Allah is describing crimes whereby people are doing things that, that deprive themselves of guidance, and what's even worse, it deprives other people of guidance. Now, if someone wants to be misguided, and he doesn't prevent other people from hearing the truth, that's between him and Allah. But the moment you yourself become a barrier for people to discover the truth, this is one of the greatest crimes that can be committed. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا أَوْ كَذَّبِ بِآيَاتِهِ now, the question is, what is the lie that was, that, that's being fabricated against God in this verse? Now, the Mufassirin of the Qur'an, they say the iftira, the lie, the fabrication, the, fabric, the fabricated lie against God in this context is assigning partners to God ascribing equals to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their fabricating a lie against God may refer, according to the Mufassirin, may refer to any of the idolatrous practices attributed 
to the pre-Islamic Arabs. So, the, so these lies that they're ascribing to God can refer to the idea that they assign partners to God, or it could refer also to some of the, for example, the, the imposition of arbitrary restrictions upon themselves. You know, brothers and sisters, not only did the Meccans as ascribe partners to Allah, they introduced some of the most absurd practices under the guise of religion. And they attributed them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that these are restrictions that God has placed upon us. If you go, for example, to Surah Al-Ma'idah, Surah number 5, ayah number 103, 103. Allah gives us an example of a fabrication, a silly restriction that the pre-Islamic Arabs imposed upon themselves and claimed that this is a divine law. They ascribed it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we read in Surah 5, Ayah 103, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ مِنْ بَحِيرَةٍ وَلَا سَائِبَةٍ وَلَا وَصِيلَةٍ وَلَا حَامٍ وَلَكِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا يَفْتُرُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبُ وَأَكْثَرُهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ Do you know what this ayah means, brothers and sisters? The Arabs, for example, the, the word bahira in this ayah, it refers to the she-camel whose milk was spared for the idols. There was a type of she-camel where they wouldn't allow anyone to drink from the milk of this she-camel, and they would say that this milk only belongs to the idols. So they deprive themselves of the milk of this she-camel because they say that this is only for the idols. Sa'iba refers to a she-camel that was let loose for free pasture for their guards, and they wouldn't put any burden or load on this she-camel. Again, they would not allow people to eat from the meat of this camel. They would not allow anyone to use it. Wasila is a she-camel that was set free after it gave birth to two she-camels back to back. So if there's a sheik, if there's a camel that gives birth to a she camel and then another she camel, they reserve this camel moving forward to the idols. No one is allowed to use it. No one is allowed to take milk from it or sacrifice it. It belongs only to the to the idols. And then Ham is a stallion camel freed from work by their idols after it had finished a number of copulations. So you see. They invented these restrictions upon themselves. And what's worse is that they ascribed it to Allah. They say this is part of Sharia. Ah. And, it, 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 and it, it, it creates a lot of difficulty for people. Unnecessary restrictions. Now, what's the, the practical lesson for you and I, brothers and sisters, when we read an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling those who deprive other peoples of guidance or who fabricate lies to Allah against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the most unjust. You know, sometimes, brothers and sisters, when people ask us religious questions and we answer without having sufficient knowledge on the topic, we also fall into this category. Sometimes someone may ask you a question. They see that you're religious, you pray, you fast, and they say, sister, is this halal or haram? Is this tahir or najis? Is this wajib or mustahab? And sometimes we answer because we're embarrassed to say, I don't know. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi, has a beautiful hadith. He says, Uhrub min al-futya harabaka min al-asad. The Imam alayhi salam, he says, run away from giving a fatwa, a religious verdict, in the same way you run when you see a lion. Meaning that if you're not qualified, if you don't have knowledge, don't answer religious questions. Because not only are you harming your own soul by commenting on a topic that you're not qualified to comment on, your answer could misguide other people. 
And therefore you fall under the category of what? وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا You're ascribing lies to God. You're saying that this is part of Allah's deen. This is part of Sharia. When in fact, it's not. And the ayah ends, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الظَّالِمُونَ Surely, the wrongdoers will not prosper. Now, wrongdoers, brothers and sisters, people who commit dhulm, they may materialistically prosper. Sometimes you see someone, for example, Saddam Hussein, a tyrant, a despotic ruler. He used to prevent people from ziyarah, from going to the mosques. And he lived a very lavish life. He had many palaces. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says these people will not prosper, what does it mean? Does that mean that they're going to live a dirt poor life? It doesn't mean that. On the outside, they may live very comfortably, but internally they are disturbed. Because true happiness is in the heart. And it's interesting that prosperity, for the word prosperity, the, the Arabic word, Yuflihu is being used. You know, brothers and sisters, this is a very un very interesting word in the Arabic language. Falah means prosperity, success. The Arabs used to call a farmer Falah. Why? The farmer puts a lot of hard effort in planting the seeds. When does the farmer see the fruits of his labor? Immediately or no? He has to wait to see the reward for all of his hard work. The mu'min is the same way. You and I, brothers and sisters, we're like the farmers. In this dunya, we're planting the seeds. The true prosperity will be gained when we reap the harvest in the akhirah. This is a declarative statement that someone who does dhulm because they did not invest in their own souls, they will not taste prosperity in this life. In this life, even though they live materialistically, comfortably, they're not at ease. They're disturbed. They don't have that tranquility. And in the akhirah, they have nothing to harvest because they weren't like the farmer who planted. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next ayah, He says, وَيَوْمَ نَحْشُرُهُمْ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ نَقُولُ لِلَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَيْنَ شُرَكَاءُكُمُ الَّذِينَ كُنْتُمْ تَزْعُمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and on the day when we shall gather them all together, Allah is saying, I'm going to resurrect all of them. All of humanity and even the objects that they took as gods other than me. Even the deities that they worshipped other than me. Allah says, I will resurrect all of them. I will gather all of them together. We shall say unto those who ascribed partners with God, where are those partners whom you claim? Brothers and sisters, we have many ahadith that describe some of the scenes of the Day of Judgment. There's a hadith that I want to share with you, just so we can place and try to visualize this, uh, this moment where Allah has all, of, all human beings resurrected from their graves. Jinn, human beings... Imagine the trillions upon trillions who will be standing on that day before Allah. Amir al-Mu'mineen salam he describes the difficulty of that day, the scene of that day. He says, وَذَلِكَ يَوْمٌ يَجْمَعُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ الْأَوَّلِينَ وَالْآخِرِينَ Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says, on that day, that is the day, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, when Allah will gather all the people from the first generation and the last generation of people. Adam alayhi salam, his children, 
his great-grandchildren, generation after generation, from the time of Adam until the day of Qiyamah, all of these people will be gathered. لِنِقَاشِ الْحِسَابِ وَجَزَاءِ الْأَعْمَالِ They will be interrogated about their, they will be questioned about their deeds, and they will be compensated for their actions. خُضُوعًا قِيَامًا the Imam says everyone will be standing. You know, sometimes when you're standing for a long time, you want to sit down. Amir al-Mu'mineen says everyone will be humbled. They will be debased. They will be standing before Allah. Qad al Amir al-Mu'mineen, he says everyone will be dripping with sweat on that day. If you think summertime is hot in Seattle or Arizona, Amir al muminin says, everyone is going to be dripping with sweat. And the ground, the earth, will be trembling. And I imagine that scene, brothers and sisters. Everyone is sweating profusely, uncomfortable. The earth is trembling beneath you. Then the Imam says, فَأَحْسَنُهُمْ حَالًا مَنْ وَجَدَ لِقَدَمَيْهِ مَوْضِعًا وَلِنَفَسِهِ مُتَّسَعًا Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he says, the person who's in the best condition on that day, the person who's in the best condition on that day will be the one who's able to find a spot for his feet and who will be able to draw breath. You know when you're in a big crowd, sometimes, for those of you who've been to Hajj, when you're in the middle of doing tawaf and you're in a huge crowd, sometimes you can't find enough space to plant your feet. And because it's so crowded, you have to lift up your head just to get a breath. Amir al-Mu'mineen says this is, like, this is like the day of Qiyam. The best, per, the people who are in the best state on that day are those who are able to find enough space for their feet and who are able to breathe. This is the day of Qiyam. So brothers and sisters, in the ayah, ayah number 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will ask those who associated partners with me. Allah is going to have a conversation with these mushrikeen. He's going to ask them, this deity, this God, whether it's a physical God or an intangible God that you took as an object of worship, that you made, you made it the direction of your life. Where are these partners now? Several Quranic passages, my dear brothers and sisters, depict those who ascribe partners unto God being asked on the day of judgment. There are many verses in the Quran where Allah asks the mushrikeen, where are your partners? Where is your ilah that you used to take as an object of worship, whether it's your own nafs or it's money or it's a, an idol made of wood, wherever, or it's a system, an ideology, whatever it may be. In some cases, there are some ayat where the mushrikeen continue to call upon those false deities to no avail. They call upon these things that they used to worship, but there's no response. While in other verses, you find the mushrikeen admitting. They admit their wrongdoing. They admit their religious error. But here, if you look at the next ayah, it's very interesting what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. So Allah is asking them, Allah asks them a question. Where are, where are those partners whom you claimed? Allah is asking the mushrikeen this question. In this ayah, what does Allah tell us about the way that they respond? How do they respond? Are they calling out to their false gods? No. Are they admitting their wrongdoing in this ayah? No. What do we read? ثُمَّ لَمْ تَكُنْ فِتْنَتُهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْ قَالُوا 
والله ربنا ما كنا مشركين سبحان الله how do they respond Allah says their excuse will be nothing but they are gonna say wallah they're gonna say wallahi our Lord we were not mushrikeen can you imagine brothers and sisters how polluted a person's soul has to be that even on the day of judgment they try to conceal the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they lie on the day of judgment can you imagine that now there are a number of explanations that have been put forward you see on the day of judgment we know that there are ayat of the Quran that tell us that their limbs will bear testimony against them there are witnesses so how could it be that the mushrikeen are gonna blatantly lie to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment saying that we weren't mushrikeen some mufassirin of the Quran they say that the day of judgment and this seems to be a pretty strong opinion that the day of judgment seems to be a number of stages you know just like when you bring a criminal into a courtroom and that criminal doesn't know about the evidence that is stacked against him he when he walks in when the trial begins or the case begins he thinks that there's no damning evidence against him so he denies the crime but later on, when all of the evidence is uncovered, that's when they admit their crime. Here, it seems that this conversation happens during the initial stages of the Day of Judgment, whereby they have just been resurrected from their graves. Allah is interrogating them, and they think that they can lie. They think that they can cover up the truth. But as they proceed through the stations of Qiyamah and their book of deeds is given to them and they see that there are malaika, there are witnesses, their own limbs are witnessing against them, that's when they admit their crime. So in the initial stages of Qiyamah, they try to play this game of denial. And then as the day of judgment continues and the evidence is presented to them, that's when they eventually admit their crime now it's interesting that now by the way the word fitna here the word fitna has many meanings in the arabic language when allah says thumma lam takun fitnatuhum illa an qalu wallahi rabbina ma kunna mushrikeen the word fitna here in this context means i'tidhar excuse or jawab their answer there are some ahadith from the Ahlul Bayt that offer another explanation. They say this ayah where the mushrikeen are denying that they're mushrikeen is actually a reference to some people from Ahlul Kitab. You see, brothers and sisters, there are many Christians today, if you ask them, are you monotheist? They say, yes, we believe in God. But in reality, if you really dissect their belief system, they're actually mushrikeen. They say, in Allah thalithu thalatha, that there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on the Day of Judgment, He will question some of these people from Ahlul Kitab and, and say to them, Aina shurakaukum, where are your partners that you ascribe to me? Where is the Son? Where is the Holy Ghost? They will say, Wallah, oh our Lord, we were not mushrikeen. But Allah will say to them that no, you're saying that you are monotheist, but your beliefs and your practices were polytheistic. These are based on some of the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt. And then if you look at ayah number 24. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Unduru kayfa kadabu ala Allah says, Behold 
how they lie against themselves. وَضَلَّ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَفْتُرُونَ يفترون. Behold how they lie against themselves. But that which they used to fabricate has forsaken them. These mushrikeen, these polytheists, these things that they took as objects of worship, these things that they held near and dear to themselves, who, what, these things that became their direction in life, they will forsake you. Anything that you invest in other than Allah, anyone that you take as your wali other than Allah will abandon you on the day of judgment. So here, as well as elsewhere, all false authorities and deities worshipped in this life will forsake their worshippers in the next life. And one example of this is in Surah Ibrahim, Surah number 14, ayah number 22, where Allah, where this, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quotes shaitan on the day of judgment. Shaytan on the day of Qiyamah, brothers and sisters, he's going to make a public declaration to everybody on the day of judgment. He spent this entire life misguiding and deceiving and manipulating, and he was able to recruit many to his path. On the day of judgment, he will address all of those who followed him, who fell into his trap. Allah says, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ After it's all said and done, after dunya is finished, when everyone is standing before Allah for the final reckoning, when Allah decrees who's going to go to Jannah and who's going to go to Jahannam, shaitan is going to make his public address. What does shaitan say? وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَعَدَكُمْ وَعَدَ الْحَقِّ Shaytan will say, listen everybody, indeed, surely what Allah has promised is the truth. وَوَعَدْتُكُمْ And I also made promises. فَأَخْلَفْتُكُمْ But I break my promise today. وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ Shaytan, Iblis, on the Day of Judgment, he will say that I did not have any authority over any of you. All, the only power that I had, Shaytan says, I just invited you. I had the power of suggestion, of waswas, but I had no authority over you. I couldn't, I couldn't force you or compel you to do anything against your will. I invited you and you accepted my invitation. فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ It seems on the Day of Judgment, many people are going to point the finger at Shaytan. They're going to point the finger at Iblis. Iblis on the day of Qiyamah will say, don't blame me. Blame who? Blame yourselves. وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ مَا أَنَا بِمَصْرِخِكُمْ وَمَا أَنْتُمْ بِمَصْرِخِي I cannot answer your cries and nor can you answer my cries. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us in the last ayah, أُنظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَذَبُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ they lie to themselves. They convince themselves that we can take other guardians other than Allah. We have other protectors other than Allah. But they deceive themselves. And those things, those objects, those institutions, those authorities, those ideologies that they took as, that they deified, that they took as objects of worship, none of that was any avail to them. Only having Allah as your guardian, as your protector, that is what will save you on that final day. Ayah number 25 is a bit lengthy, my dear brothers and sisters, so inshallah we'll leave that for our next session. If there are any 
questions or comments, inshallah, we have some time before we uh, break for salah. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Sheikh, uh, one question. Yes. Talk about the people who said that they were not, who said that they weren't mushrikeen. Could that even include people like uh, who consider themselves to be Muslims, but then they really they spend a lot of time listening to their own nafs and they have different forms of shirk in their hearts because of that. Here in the in this ayah, it seems to be referring to a shirk al akbar, the 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 major shirk. Because technically, as you mentioned, shirk can come in different forms. You know, someone, for example, who, who, who does a good deed, riya'an, to show off, this is a shirk al-khafi. This is, you know, a subtle shirk. But here, in this context, what's being referenced is actual polytheism, where it's, it's a part of your ideology. It's not just in your behavior. It's in your ideology, where you actually believe that when you look at the belief system of these individuals, they were ascribing partners to God, even though in their minds they were monotheists. So this is a reference to a shirk al-akbar. Assalamu alaikum, I have a question. Um, before I come to my question, uh, if I just look at my notes, um, um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, negative words like shirk, uh, kufr, shaitan, misleading, uh, lying, jahannam. So obviously this, uh, this number of ayahs are, are very, um, um, I don't know what the right word for that is, but it's, it's negative. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was just an observation. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to. Uh, and, and if you think about it, it's actually suitable because if you remember, you know, the audience in Surah Al An'am, as, as you remember, we're, we're speaking about the late Meccan period. So, on the one hand, you have this small, fragile, vulnerable Muslim community that's in need of consolation, and also you have the audience and the, the other audience who are the the kuffar, the mushrikeen, who have been antagonizing the Muslims for almost a decade. So it's suitable that the language will be a little bit more harsh. The tone will be a bit more stern because we're dealing with people who have been rejecting haq for 10 years, right? Right. But it's, a, it's an excellent observation. So, um, so I'm trying to make it a habit for myself to... Um, to have a uh, practical lesson from from each lecture that we have here, yes. I'm trying to to see what uh, what the um, what we can call as actionable when we get out of out of the room here uh, to continue thinking about it and, and trying to practice it. Um, so I think one of the things you mentioned is um, um, that goes into the direction of of making sure. Uh, was answering uh, religious questions without being qualified. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, that's a very important point. Uh, do you mind to, to explain that a little bit more, um, where you see that very often? Um, you, you know, I, I, f I find myself having to remind myself and others, especially in the month of Ramadan, because if you know, if you remember, one of the things that invalidate your fast in the month of Ramadan is ascribing lies or something inaccurate to Allah or his messenger. That's why you find that many khutaba that I know, they, they don't, they're hesitant to lecture or recite a majlis during the day in the month of Ramadan because they may mention a hadith that, that is not authentic and therefore they may be ascribing something that's false to Allah and His Messenger. Now, of course, for it to invalidate your fast, it has to be intentional. But the idea is that even the month of Ramadan, subhanAllah, it's it's a spiritual program that's meant to train you to be meticulous and to be thorough before you, you answer or you pass on information, religious information to others. So I, I really believe, you know, there's a hadith from the Holy Prophet that says, 
Half of knowledge is to admit that you don't know. You know, sometimes, you know, youngsters, our children, they ask us questions and, you know, we're embarrassed to say, I don't know. Let me check. Let me look it up. We need to get into the habit. Only answer a religious question when you're certain. If you're not certain, even if you're 90% sure, double check, triple check. Because again, you're talking about information that could, could, could potentially mislead other people. It's, it's difficult enough to meet Allah on the Day of Judgment with your own burden. Now, if you want to add a, you know, more burden on your shoulder on the Day of Judgment by being the reason why people were given inaccurate information, that's something that we have to be very cautious about. Mulan, a follow-up question on that is um, um, that also applies to, is that correct that it's also applying to the actions that you're making, not just answering verbally, but also, um, but also uh, you, you know, practicing uh, um, wrong things that are teaching, let's say, um, teaching ki our kids and our ch children the wrong, uh, the wrong um, uh, action. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, if, if you do anything and people interpret that as part of, as part of religion and you're, 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 you're performing that action in a way that you're trying to convey that this is part of Islam or part of the Sharia ah, without, you know, verifying that it's at such, you also fall under the category of وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ اَفْتَرَى عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا So you have, we have to be very careful about the attributions that we make to Allah and His Messenger and to Islam itself. We have to be very, very cautious. So yeah, you know, sometimes when we read these verses, we think, oh, Allah is talking about those, you know, those evil people 14 centuries ago. No, these verses are al alive and well today among many people. You know, sometimes even in our communities, you know, they, they make certain statements without proper knowledge and they're essentially fabricating lies against God. Which is a really a, a heinous crime, because you're 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 gonna potentially misguide many people, and then you establish a a false sunnah. You know sometimes certain information is perpetuated, and people absorb it absorb it without questioning, and then they teach it to their children, and they and then generation after generation, and there's a false sunnah that's been established. Why? Because someone answered a question without verifying. Someone made a statement without doing their research. That's how bid'ah comes to, into the, the religion. That's how innovations are introduced. Uh, just a clarification on that last question uh, about the actions. Uh, you mean that if someone's like deliberately trying to make other people think that their actions are implying some religious... Yes, yes. If it's like they're doing something... And someone else just assumes it's religious without the person. Yeah, I mean, again, if, if something, if someone just makes an assumption, we're talking about you know someone who is deliberately making you know certain attributions. So, uh, one more question. Yes. Uh, you talked about um, like the who is uh, more doing a greater wrong than one who conceals the testimony from God. Could you kind of elaborate a bit more on like what does it mean to conceal a testimony from God? Because it says from God, not concealing it from other people. Mm -hmm. no, from God, meaning that the testimony is from God, not you're concealing it from God. So, for example, if you look at, you know, historically, many of the, the rabbis and the priests, they would conceal certain truths within their scriptures from the masses. You know, for example, about the advent of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa So that, the concealing that testimony from God, you know, resulted in many people not, be, many people being deprived of the truth. So it's not that they're concealing it from God, a testimony from God. The testimony is from God and they're concealing it. Okay. Is it clear? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. a testimony from God meaning wahi. Revelation, scripture. That makes much more sense. <laughs> I have another question, Malana. Um, so one of the things you mentioned is that um, the about the greatest wrong um, being those actions that are not only impacting yourself but also others. Yeah. 
Um, so this seems to be something very important. Impacting other people seems to be something very important that it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it's the greatest wrong. Yeah. Um, so is it also fair to say that on the other side, impacting other people in a positive way is is a greatest deed? Is that something that makes sense? That's a very, very good observation. In fact, we have you know, so so you're right, you know, so on the one hand negatively impacting people depriving people of truth is the greatest wrong that you can do conversely guiding people guiding others to the truth is the best thing that you can do and that's why we have a, a, a narration from the holy prophet where he says to amir al-mumin ya ali la yahdi allahu bika rajulan wahida khayrun laka mimma tal'at alayhi shams oh ali if allah guides one person through you meaning if you have a positive impact on another individual and you connect them to their Lord, it is better than anything that the sun shines on, meaning that there's nothing better than this. So it's a very, very good point. So yeah, negatively impacting people is the worst that you could do. Positively impacting people is among the best things that you can do. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Please include me in your da'a, inshallah, and uh, I uh, I look forward to uh, spending uh, next uh, the next session together, inshallah. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you.